be here with you this evening in the beginning of this series of gospel meetings. It's a pleasure to be able to stand before you and, and share what I little I know, and uh, I hope that maybe the things that we are able to share with you will help us all in being a Christian. I mentioned this morning that this week I would like to do a series of the history of the church, and uh, I think we'll find it most interesting. I think we need to know who we are, and I think we need to know what we are and how we got here. And uh, I'd have to say we're not in a very good place worldwide as far as, uh, you know, the world and condition of the world. But I think as far as the church is concerned, you know, we're in the best place we can be, considering anything that could happen that might happen. So we, 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 will, we may not spend the whole week in, on this because the advantage of this sermon that I have, uh, the first segment has about 79 slides. So we can't get through that in one service. And so we'll go as far as we can tomorrow night, and then the next night we'll go as far as we can. We'll get as far as we can, and then maybe towards the end of the week we'll get into just some basic uh, sermons, uh, uh, you know, that we, that we do. But I, but I think you'll enjoy the, uh, at least I do, I enjoy the history of the church. And I think we all need to know that our young people as well as all of us need to be back based on it. Now tonight, this is kind of a overall picture of the history of the church, talking about the seven churches of Asia. And it's kind of like that Andy would call it a trailer, you know, being in the in the, the, radio, in the television business. You've seen advertisements, I'm sure, about movies that are coming out. And they'll give you a little snippet of this, and they'll give you a little snippet of that, and just kind of teasing you so that they make sure that you get enough of it that you want to come back for the whole picture and, and all of that being connected together. I guess tonight that's what this sermon is. It's a trailer. Of, of, of the history of the church. And I, I look at the seven churches of Asia, perhaps maybe a little different than, than a lot of other folks, but I hope that you will uh, kind of get to the gist of, of what is happening. You see, what we oftentimes do in the book of Revelation, we know it's a book of metaphors and pictures and, uh, you know, uh, visions and, and dragons with heads and crowns and and all of that stuff. And so you have to kind of interpret what those things represent. In other words, they do represent something, and I think they do represent the history of the church. The entire book of, of Revelation, I believe, represents the history of the church. Because Jesus in the very first the chapter says, you know, these things that are and that will be. And so we have a, a you know, if we could just understand this great book of Revelation, I think we'd be able to see what this, it was going to happen. Of course, now it's easy for us because I believe most of it has been fulfilled, and I think we can go back and we can say, well, you know, this fits this period of time, and this fits this period of time, and so forth and so on. Now, in, in, in our, our dear sister has put it on uh, YouTube, the original uh, sermons that I had on Revelation, and I really appreciate that. And what, and what I did there, though, was that we only covered the first half of Revelation. We covered Revelations, the 11th chapter to verse 17, because I think that's where it ends, and it starts all over again. I think Revelations is two parts. The first part, from chapter 1 through chapter 11, have to do with the history of the church in the world and its relationship to the Roman government, the Mohammedism, all of those forces, of course, that would have a part or have a play in trying to destroy Christianity. And so you, you know, you have all of that history that is involved in there. And again, I'm not going to cover a lot of that tonight. We may cover some of it in the history of the church, but not going through it as far as Revelations is concerned. But it's simply history and, and what we know that the Bible talks about some of the prophecies regarding that. The next segment of Revelation starts, I believe, chapter 11, verse 18 or 19, and goes on through the end of the chapter. This segment has to do, and I, 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 I sometimes hesitate to even talk about this because I don't like to talk about any religion, any other religion. I don't like to, to, to say that any other religion is wrong or whatever. I mean, that, I, I, I have my own personal view, but me to get up here and, and just talk about a religion... But I believe that second half has to do with Roman Catholicism. I believe it has to do with the fallen church, the church that departed from the true church. 
And, and, and there are, are many, many things within that category, of course, that I never have covered in my first uh, presentation of Revelation. We'll get into some of that in this study of the, because it's, it's just a part of the history of what has happened to the church. So without any further ado and instruction, we'll just get into this uh, little segment tonight about the seven churches. Now, there are in Revelation four angles that you need to recognize. Revelation is not that hard to figure out. Some people get scared of it, and some people just kind of shy away, never read it, never teach it. But it, 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 it's pretty easy when you put it in its, its perspective. Again, first of all, you have those two segments that are there. But then you have the four angles of Revelation. And these four angles each have the number seven associated with it. You have the seven churches, which we're going to talk about tonight, chapters two and three. And uh, then you have the seven seal book, which comes up in a few chapters now, in chapter five, the seven seal book. There was a book that had seven seals. And, uh, and, and, and John was all upset because it appeared that there was nobody that could unloose the seals. And then finally, you know, it was said, you know, the, the, the line of the tribe of Judah and, the, and, and all that, he had the power and the, and, and the strength and the ability to open the seal. So as each seal was opened, there is a vision. And in these seals, you remember there was horses of different colors and different riders on them and all of that. And each, every one of those has a representation. So you have this, each seal is open and you come down to the seventh seal and that is the end. Just as I believe when you come to the seventh church, that is the end. So now we have, there are seven trumpets that are blown. And once more, the angel stands up and he blows this, uh, this, this trumpet. There are, there are seven angels and they blow a trumpet, one after another, one in succession to another, one through seven. And as each of those trumpets are blown, there is a vision that John sees and he describes it and writes it in what we call the book of Revelation. And then last of all, towards the end of the book, there is the seven vials. And in this you see a picture of a scientist. And it's, it's the, the vision is a scientist that has a vial, you know, a, a, a glass a container. And in this glass container, you've seen the mad scientist, you know, you put this mixture in, put this mixture in, and it explodes, or it smokes, or does whatever. And, and, and so that's the vision that John wants you to get, that in this flask, in this vial, are, are things that are of detriment. They are things that destroy and so, once again, you have another perspective, and it's in consecutive order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, what I believe we have here are the different angles of the church. There are so many things that has happened through the church through the years that, that these all represent the same period of time. In other words, number one, as far as the first age of the church could be described with the first vial that is poured out, or it could be described as the first trumpet that is blown. There's a there's a vision. It's like this building that we're living that, that we're in right now. I'm living here before you're worshiping. So we're in this building. If you if you stood out there to that side and you describe this side of the building, you say, well, it has four windows, you know, and it's so many feet long, and I can see the roof, you know, line going up there. But if you stood out in the front, it would be an altogether different description. It'd be a front door and, uh, and you know, the, uh, the the concrete walk and, and the railing and all that. If you stood over here, you'd see something different. You'd see the end of that railing over there. If you stood in the back, you'd see something altogether different. But however you described it, you're describing the same building. The same building. It's just looking at it from four different angles. And that's what we have in Revelation. There are four groups major groups of sevens. There's a lot of sevens in Revelation, but there are four major groups, and these are those four groups. Seven is a unique number in the Bible. It's especially a unique number in Revelation. It is a number that means completeness. Anytime you have seven of something, you have something that is complete. God created the world in seven days. You have a complete unit of time. The Levitical system was built around a system of sevens. The seventh day was the Sabbath day. The seventh year was a special year. And we count time by every 100 years. You know, every century it changes and it becomes, you know, kind of remarkable as it did when it changed from, you know, 1999 to 2000 and all of that. 
And so you had you, you have the uh, counting of times and the Jews counted times by fifties. But the way they did this was there were seven years of seven. There was seven sevens, which makes forty-nine. And they would cap that off with what they called the Jubilee year. You've heard of the Jubilee year, and the Jubilee year, they were supposed to relieve all debts. If you had if, if you owed anybody money, they were supposed to free you from the debt. If you had, you know, a, a prison term, you were set free. I mean, there were a lot of things that took place on the Jubilee year. It was a year of freedom. And, and, and then, of course, they would start counting again. The next seven years, the next seven years. So, but, but the, the Jubilee year was kind of what rounded it off and made it 50. And, and all through the Bible. You know, there are seven colors of the rainbow. I don't know if you knew that or not. There's just seven colors. And you can take those seven colors and make any color that's known to man by a mixture of them. What is it that blue and green make something? But anyway, you know, you can, you can make that. And, and so there's only seven. Did you know that every psalm in this psalm book right here is written with seven notes? Do, re, count. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do. You know, it starts with one and ends with do, but there's only seven of them. So seven is a complete number. It, it, it completes everything. So when you think of Revelation using the seven things here, I think we're talking about a complete system. Now, I tried over here to put a timeline. My timeline's a little crooked. And that's why, as I was telling Andy, I like to use the, 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 the slides because, you know, I can make things straight. But, but life's crooked anyway, isn't it? So we're going to kind of go up and down here on this timeline. We've started, this timeline doesn't go back to the beginning, we started here with AD 33, which we're familiar with, is a period of time which was the establishment of the church. So that's where we're starting, and that's of course where Revelation starts at the beginning of the age of the church. They reveal the events of the history of the church. So once again, keep in mind this succession of numbers. So what I'm going to try to share with you tonight, and hope to be able to prove to you that number one, was the very first thing that happened to the church. Number two was the second thing. Number three, number four, on down through time. My personal opinion is we're in number seven now. And that ought to alarm us. I believe we're under number seven. That ought to alarm us because there's no more churches. There's no more time. There's no more, no more continuing on. When this age is done, then, then it's done and it's over. And I think our Lord's going to come and, and, and take his people home. So, let's look at the map here. We're talking about the seven churches of Asia. Asia is that orange, yellowish, the, the, the dark yellow over here. That was Asia. And it's called Turkey now in, in our, our, our country, our, in, in our time. I thought I had, oh, there it is, down here. Let's go back. Okay, this right here, this is Asia, and Asia Minor. You'll recognize a lot of the a lot of the, the names here. You know, Bithynia, Pisidia, Messiah. These were areas where Paul and others had gone and had preached. In a process of time, in a very short time, in fact, probably up until about the year of 100 or so, there was a lot of churches that had been established by men who could travel no faster than they could walk. I mean, you know, this is amazing how much, how fast the church did go. And a lot of it was because down here in Jerusalem, there was a lot of persecution from the Jews. And people began to leave Jerusalem because they thought, well, if I go up into Asia, I can worship my God as I see I was instructed to worship. And I don't have to worry about the Jews and all that. The only problem was when they got up in here, they kind of like jumped out of the pan into the fire. Because up in this country, you had people that were just... Heathens. I mean, they didn't believe in any god. Or they, the gods they did have were gods made out of stone or stars or whatever. So, you know, they didn't help themselves really any, but they thought they were. So, as a result of that, a lot of the churches were started. This is Asia. Uh, up in here is what was called uh, Macedonia. You know, the churches of Thessalonica, Philippi. Uh, there was Corinth. And, and, and so, as I said, the churches were planted all over that country. It would move from there, and Europe is just a little bit further over here where there was Rome and, and uh, all of those various cities and various places that you read about in the Bible. But one of the things I wanted to share with this map was this. You know, in Revelation, you have the seven, and you have uh, Ephesus, 
You have Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sidon, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Did you know those are in a circle in Asia? Look at them. There's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So not only do you have the seven, but you have a circle, which is a complete image as well. A circle of churches. Now, why were these seven chosen? Why were these seven spoken about when you have all these others that they could have mentioned? There may have been, and I, I'm sure there is, because, you know, as he describes it, these were letters that were written to that church. But, you know, there were problems in that church that was just like what it describes here. But more than that, these problems that existed within these churches, or they were not always problems, the church of Philadelphia was a great church, and there's no condemnation for it at all. But the things that existed there are things that would exist through time in their consequential manner. In other words, one by one, it would come about. And I hope, as I said, to be able to show you that in our sermon here today. All right. The letters to the seven churches, they're all the same. It's kind of like, you know, you have a computer and you got a form letter. Did you ever get a form letter? You felt really important because all they did was put your name up here and it's the same letter everybody else gets. And that's the way the church, the letters to the churches were. They all had the same form. Every one of them were penned exactly the same. Number one, there was an order given to John to write the letter. Number one, every one of them were given that order. There was a glorious title given to Jesus. Every one of them described Jesus and his eloquency and his greatness. But a different title was given to him under each one. Secondly, a description is given about the church, whether it was good or whether it was bad. And they were admonished or they were exhorted. That's the meat of the letter, I guess you could say, the reason the letter was written. Fourthly, a promise was given to those who would persevere and trumpet and triumph over that situation. And then there was always, in every one of them, this closing injunction, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So the Spirit was revealing this information through John to write unto these churches. It said as if it was written to the angels of the churches, which of course angels sometimes can mean the leaders or the elders of the church, whatever, but each one of them would get this letter. And of course it would eventually be composed into book form as we have as the book of Revelation. All right. After all of that, and we'll probably cover more of that through our study of the history of the church, let's just get into the seven churches themselves. The Ephesian church is the first one that is mentioned in Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7. This period of time, I believe, started about the year 100. Now remember, the church was started in about AD 33. So I believe this period of time started in about the year 100, and I'll give you the reason why I, 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 I believe that. It represents a time after the death of the apostles. The last apostle to die, as far as we know, was John. The, you know, the, the, the book that we have that we're studying, you're studying here. He was, he was, if not the last, he was one of the last to die. He was a, a, in the year of AD 96, AD 97 is when he wrote the book of Revelation. He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And there in the Isle of Patmos, he wrote to these things, these visions, of course, which was given to him through the Spirit of God. And as I said, it is thought that he was the last to die, that he died a natural death, even though he was imprisoned and so forth. But many of the other apostles, they died horrible deaths, you know, being persecuted and, and various things that happened unto them. But, but the people's fervor and the dedication had begun to diminish by this time. And that is the reason that he came, and, and, and the, the first thing that he says about this is he says, you know, talking about the church there at Ephesus, I have someone against you because you have left your first love. That was the problem with the church at Ephesus. I have someone against you because you have left your first love. Now let me see if I can explain this to you. Every organization... I don't care if it's spiritual, religious, or worldly. It doesn't make any difference. They all work the same. Every organization, when it is started, is full of life. It's exciting. It's something that we want to be a part of, and everybody's a part of it. At home, back in 1972, 70, the early 70s, we started a, uh, a fire company at Lake Council 
Now, up to that time, if a house burnt, you might as well just let it burn because Clearfield was 15 miles away. By the time they got there, they put the fire out around the chimney, and it was, it was done. But you see, we thought, boy, this is great. We get to have a fire company, and, 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 and the whole town, I mean the whole town, it didn't make a difference what religious denomination you were or whatever, the whole town just, you know, backed it. They wanted this fire company. And we got excited about it. And in the meetings, we had the whole community come out. We had fundraisers, you know, and so forth. And everybody participated. <laughs> Today, in 2023, you can't hardly get anybody to volunteer for it. You see, when something is started, the people who started are on fire. And they put all they have into it. They put their money into it. They put their time into it. And you've seen this happen over and over again. When things like this start, it's so exciting, everybody gets involved. But when those first original people die, <laughs> the younger generation's not as, as excited about it. They haven't had anything to do with it. Now it's a chore to keep it going, you know, to participate, to volunteer, to provide money and so forth. It becomes a drudgery to a lot of people because we're not as excited as our forefathers were. Brothers and sisters, that's exactly what's happening to the church. You have to recognize this. It, it, it's, it, you know, their, their first love. I mean, this was their first love. The church was their first love. But when those original people died who knew Jesus, who had seen Jesus, who had, had, had knew that he was the Son of God, when they all died, now we're talking about a younger generation that heard it from my grandpa, you know, from my aunt and my uncle. And it's not as exciting now as it was. Especially because of the next church where we talk about the persecution that came into the church. But, and, and here's something that I'm sure that you would recognize. Now, I don't know how long the church has developed this here. But do you know, you know most churches never make it past 100 years? Most churches never make it over 100. There's only one that I know. There may be others, maybe in West Virginia or somewhere that you brothers have been associated with and I'm not familiar with. But there was one in the Tumble, Iowa that just had his 100th year celebration about 10 years ago. But there's only five members left. That's all that means, it's five members. So it's not going to be long that that church even isn't going to be on the list of 100 years old churches. There's not many churches that last over 100 years. Why? Because the brethren who started this church to develop, a lot of them are gone. A lot of them are gone. You are the next generation or the next generation or the third or fourth generation or whatever. And you may not be as excited as your forefathers were when they planted the church here in this spot and not excited about it and, and worked at it and so forth. You all know how it was. I'm sure if you've been around the church at all, you all know when you had gospel meetings years ago. I'm talking about 40, 50 years ago. Why, you, you couldn't hold the people in this building that would come out to this meeting. And there would be people would come from all over in wagons and buggies and horses and so forth to these meetings because they were excited about this new church had developed in Kentucky. And they, and, and they supported this congregation. As time continues on, we have a tendency to lose our first love. And that's what happened to the church. They were losing their first love. And Jesus told them, he says, I... He says, I, I tell you that you need to go back. You need to repent. You need to uh, embrace that first love again. You need to get back to be excited about the church and so forth. So the church at Ephesus described the church at about the age or the year of 100. All right, let's go to the next one then. Time moves on. My time's running out here. All right, this, well, it's only 4 o'clock in the afternoon, isn't it? Four minutes, so we got plenty of time. So the Smyrna church... The Smyrna, the church at Smyrna, or is the next one, and it is referred to over here in continuing on in verses eight through eleven. I believe that this describes a period of time that was probably between the year of one hundred to three hundred. We're talking about two hundred years now involved in the church, and as I said, we'll talk more about these things specifically when we get into the history. But it is the age of the great persecution of the Romans. Even though the church was losing its heart or losing its fervor or its spirit or whatever, the Romans realized how impressive the church was. They, they, they realized the impact that Christianity had upon its world. 
And the Roman Empire was the greatest empire in the world, and it controlled whole, the whole world. And they realized that, you know, here was a group of people that would rather bow down to King Jesus than King Caesar. They understood that, and they were afraid that what was going to happen when they began to do that and continue to do that. And so within every one of the emperors just about, they decided we've got to eliminate this group of people, or we're going to be headed for trouble because they bow down to King Jesus and do not bow down to King Caesar. So he describes them, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them would say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. He said, fear none of those things. And so the age, this was the age of the catacombs because he's talking about persecution. He's talking about fear and so forth. I believe that this was the age of the catacombs. This was the age of the great period of martyrdom. I'm sure you've heard preachers in the past talking about, you know, the, uh, uh, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. You've heard of that book, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which describes hundreds and thousands of people that were martyred for Christianity. It was in this period of time that all of that went on, between the year of 100 and 300. That in this passage, it says, Be thou faithful ten days. Uh, verse uh, uh, 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful to death, and thou shalt receive a crown of life. So there was going to be a period of ten days involved here. Remember, Revelation is not specific when it comes to time. Ten days simply means ten something, a, a ten periods of time. And, and so... Those who have studied this, I haven't taken the time to look into it that deeply, but those who have studied this say that there were 10, in this period of time, between 100 and 300, that there were 10 distinct persecutions brought against the church. I'm talking about, you know, they would persecute it for maybe several years, and then there was a relief, and then they'd come back, and they would do it again in another way, or another emperor would step into the power, and he would bring it. But there were 10 distinct forms of persecution that were brought against the church during those days. Let's move on to the Pergamus period. Now we're, you know, we're uh, here at, at this point right here, Revelations 2, 12 through 17. And I have a specific year wrote down here. I think that we can kind of pinpoint a year, not a range of years, but I think it's definitely we can pinpoint a particular year. The, the age is between or is and began about the year of 325. Now, this didn't happen overnight, understand. This was building up to a certain point, but there was a great change that took place in the church in the year 325. And it is described in the church here of Pergamos. To the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things say he that is sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seed is. So there's kind of a little, you know, insight here of, as to the church he's talking about. He says, you dwell where Satan's seed is. What is Satan's seed? Is it not the world? It's the world. Satan told Jesus one time, when he tempted him, he took him up on the high mountain, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, all of this is mine. Satan said that. He said, all of this is mine. He said, I'll give it all to you, all the honor and the glory that's in these kingdoms. I'll give it to you if you will just now bow down and worship me. You remember that story. So the world is Satan's seat. He has it. It's, he's taken it over, so to speak. And, and I, I suppose we can say there's, there's things that happen, you know, where it's taken away and comes back or whatever. But, but at this time, he was in control of the world. And so he says, I have a problem. He says, you dwell where Satan's seed is. He said, he said, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what is the doctrine of Balaam? You've heard the story of Balaam and Balaam. Balaam was a king of an enemy nation against God's people. Balaam was a prophet of God. So Balaam, he couldn't do anything with God's people. He, you know, he, he tried and he failed and all of that. And so he thought if he could get the prophet and pay him off, giving the, there was a whole lot of money and things involved, if he could buy him off and get that prophet to curse God's people, 
he be able to win the battle against them? Well, Balaam, you know, he, he, he couldn't do that. He finally caved, you know, but he couldn't do that. And for all the money in the world, he wasn't going to curse his own people. He wasn't going to curse God's people. But here's what Balaam did. He didn't curse God's people, but here's what he told Balaam. He said, Balaam, if you want to win these people over, he says, you just get in amongst them. He said, you just fellowship them. Just, you know, just get in there and have your men marry their women and all of this, and you just get them to combine with you, and you finally got them. You're, you're, gonna, you're not going to win the battle fighting in a war and destroying them, but you will destroy them by intermingling within them. That's the doctrine of Balaam. And so here he's describing a church in the, in, in the year 325 where there would be a combination of the church and the state. The establishment of the state church. The church became married to the world. Constantine is the man who performs that marriage. This is all in history. And you got to read into it a little deeper than your school teacher is going to tell you now. But but, but Constantine was a bright light in this age. Now remember, they had just come off of two to three hundred years of conflict, persecution, Christians being burned at the stake, used in the amphitheaters, you know, with wild animals running all over them and eating them. That's what they had come off of. So here comes an emperor of the Roman Empire that is favorable to Christianity. His mother supposedly was baptized into the church of Christ. And Constantine was favorable to Christianity. He wanted to do everything in his power to help it. What a relief it was for Christianity. But it, it, on, on the one side, you know, it was a relief that they no longer had to face persecution because the Roman government now favored them. But it was one of the most terrible things that happened to the church because now Constantine became the head of the church. It was a church or a state-run church. And it was governed, and Constantine set up individuals to take the charge and to take the lead and so forth. This is how it all began. And you know how it is here developed. I mean, you brother, not you may not be referred to as elders, but you're leaders of the church. You make your own decisions here at Develop. But that's not the way it was under a church state situation. The state would come in and tell you what to do. And the state would come in, the government, the Roman Empire would come in and tell you what you do and what you couldn't do. And they would set up men in charge of this church. And they would set up men in charge of them and so forth. So there was a hierarchy that began with Constantine. As good as it was, as nice as it was, that persecution no longer would be a part of Christians' problems. It, was, it became a danger because it took the authority out of the local churches, the autonomy of the local churches, and put it in the hands of the government. And you've seen what the government can do with things. And, and, and that's what, ha what happened to the church. And so Constantine performed this marriage. It's the age of the exalted clergy run by the government. Now it would change in this next church that I'm going to tell you about. But it was all started by the Roman government to control and, 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 and there might have been some secret thing behind this. They realized they weren't doing any good and could not eliminate the church by its persecution. I guess maybe, once again, you turn here to Balaam, you know, we'll just join them. We'll, we'll, we'll intermix within them, and they can become a part of us, and we'll become a part of them. Then we move on to the Tyrant Church. So here you have this union of the state and the, the church. Over here in Thyatira, this is the longest period of time that uh, we have on this timeline. It was from the year about 300 all the way up to the year of 1500. And uh, as I said, it's the longest of them all. Now, I want you to listen though here. He says uh, 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 in verse 20, uh, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I give her, and listen to this carefully, I give her space to repent. This is why this is the longest period of time. God gave them 1,200 years to repent, and they never did. And so then God would step in, and another thing would take place. So there was a space for them to repent. 
uh, he, he says that he goes on, he describes the situation. But the image here is something uh, I think that we have to really consider and behold. He says, you have one there that is called Jezebel. You know who Jezebel was, don't you? She was the wife of Ahab. And Ahab was the king of the real Israel. Now, Israel at this time had been separated and was divided into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom and there was a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom contained two, maybe two and a half tribes, and they were the only tribes out of 12 that remained faithful to God. The northern kingdom and all the other tribes of Israel, of course, departed and went off into whoever knows what. But, but, but the kingdom that Ahab was over was the true kingdom of God. It was the true people of God. And, and they, uh, of course, you know, Ahab, being a king, would have been the representative of the Jewish nation. But he's married to a woman who's not even an Israelite. She comes from another nation, and she's got her own gods. And so she has these gods that are called Baal, and, 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 and uh, you know, the Baal worshipers and, and all of that. So she begins to introduce this false religion into the Jewish religion, and it became a, quite a mixture because people would turn from worshiping and uh, obeying and honoring the God of the heaven to worship this false God, which was nothing but a rock. And so here is the imagery that John is trying to describe. He says, you have one there that's likened onto Jezebel who offered fornication, promoted fornication, and this fornication is not literal, it's a spiritual fornication of associating with another God, with another religion, with another faith. And that's what we have in this story of the five time church. The age when one like one Jezebel would corrupt this people, God's people. Like Jezebel, one would rule over the church, but it would be a false prophet. This was the age that I refer to as the fallen church. I want to take you to Revelation, the 11th chapter, first of all, Revelation, the 11th chapter, as I said, this is the ending of that first segment of Revelations. In Revelation, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 1 through 2. Towards the end of that first segment, there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then the worship they ran. There are three things that had to be measured. Measure the altar, which is the place of worship. Measure the temple of God, which is the place of measure. The altar was the actual worship itself. And measure those who worship, which are the people that worship. Now the reed or the rod that he's referring to is this that I hold in my hand. He said, here's the measure." Because they had not lived and had not worshipped and had not been following the true doctrines of, of Jesus Christ. And so he said, it's time for you to measure these things. And there comes, of course, this is at the ending of this period of time, the ending of the, of the 1500 year, or 1200 years here. Now, I want to go to another passage of scripture, though, in 2 Thessalonians. In the 2 Thessalonians letter, the second chapter, Paul makes a remarkable claim. That I don't think that you can ignore at this point of our sermon here tonight. We are talking about someone who was like Jezebel and led people away from the true religion. <coughs> and I believe we're talking about, uh, once again, Rome being involved in this. I think we're talking about the Pope of Rome and all the hierarchy, of course, that was involved with that. And, and, and the, you know, how that it had already been established by, by uh, Constantine and, and the, the system had already been set up. But you see, eventually, Constantine and Rome lost its power. Lost its power. But the Roman church continued on and became the power of the world for these 1,200 years. They ruled the world for 1,200 years. The Roman Catholic Church did. Because they made the rules. And, and everybody, of course, that was associated with Christianity had to live by their rules and so forth. But in this 2 Thessalonians 2, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. In other words, don't be worried, don't be troubled in your mind by word from us, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, 
as if the day of Christ is at hand. This is Paul writing to the Thessalonian brothers. He says, he says, don't be worried if you even get a letter from us and says, you know, Jesus is coming tomorrow. He said, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. And, and so he says, don't be worried about that. For he says, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the coming of Jesus Christ again to gather his people home, he said, that day will not come except there come a falling away first. That's the words he uses right here. He said there will be a falling away of this true church. And, and, and he says when that happens, he says there come a falling away first. And he says, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now listen to how he describes him. I was in a study with a woman in Oklahoma City who was a Catholic. And I was sitting in her home. And I was just asking her to read this passage of scripture right here. It needed no explanation. It needed no consultation. She began to cry when she read it. This man is described as one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. In fact, that's his title. As a title that was given him by one of the emperors, Lord God the Pope. I'm not talking about any particular Pope, but that's the title of the Pope, Lord God the Pope. It is described right here. I mean, everything just it only reveals itself in the scriptures. And so this five time period was a period when when, you know, the, the great persecution. This was the age uh, of the Dark Ages. We'll talk more about that. You know, some of you have heard about the Dark Ages. You've studied that in school. And the teachers in school will tell you it was the Dark Ages because there was, there was no arts. For this 1,200 years, there were no great things that ever happened. It was kind of like a dead area. It was a dark area. There were no great musicals. There was no great artists. There was nothing. And that's why they say it was dark. I'll tell you why it was dark. Because the Bible was taken out of the hands of the people. During this period of time, people were not allowed to have the Bible. And what is the Bible? It is the light of God into the world. And so the Bible was not allowed. And there were people who were put to death because they tried to interpret the Bible into other languages. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, just a number of people. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about them in specifics as we get to that point. But this is that period of time right here that's called the Dark Ages. And then the church of Sardis comes. And there's a glimmer of hope now in this particular church at Sardis. And, and it's found in Revelation, the third chapter. I believe that this period of time lasted for about 300 years, two to 300 years. And this is what it says. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things say that he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, I know thy work, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. It was believed that the true church had ceased to exist. That the true church, as Jesus started, the apostles added to of the day of Pentecost no longer existed. That is not the case. It did exist. But it was it had a name that was living and, and a name that, that the people thought that it was dead, but it was not. It was continuing on in secrecy. And I'll read to you a little bit here uh, of where the Bible even talks about that. But, you know, this period of time uh, of Sardis uh, was an age I, I call the age of Reformation. This was the age when you had men like Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, John Knox, John Wesley. I'm sure you've heard those names through the years. These were men that became reformers. What happened was, at the end of this period of time, people began to open their eyes. Martin Luther was one of the priests of the Catholic Church. He began to open his eyes and he began to say, this is not right. This is not in harmony with what the Bible actually says. And so Mr. Martin Luther came out. He, he was not the first, but he is perhaps maybe the most powerful reformer because he wasn't afraid to stand up to this church. And he came out with what was called 95 Theses, 95 Things that was wrong with the Catholic Church. And he nailed them to the church house door in Wittenberg, Germany. And of course, his life was in danger at that time then. But uh, Martin Luther would go on to convert the Bible, which at that time was only in Latin. 
was never allowed to be interpreted out of any other language, and was hid, of course, and held by the Roman Catholic Church. But Martin Luther, because of his being able to be inside, was able to convert it to the German language, and then it continued to boomerang from there. Just the, you know, went into the English and all the other languages of that particular period of time. I really appreciate these men because here in this uh, church it says, Remember therefore uh, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come as a thief and thou shalt not know the hour that I come upon you. Thou hast a few names, he says. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled my garments or their garments. And they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. So there's a few names. See, there's a few of you left that's holding on to the truth, and he wanted them to realize that. So the church at, at uh, uh, Sardis, of course, that period of time, and again, we'll talk more about the Reformation later on. But the next one is number six, the age of the church of Philadelphia. To me, I believe probably this is the greatest of all periods of time, the greatest of all, because God had a hand in this. This is the period of the restoration and the reintroduction of the true church back into the world. It never died. Because remember Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I know that it's going to be alive from the time Jesus built it to now. It was in a period of hiding or an area of hiding in the catacombs and so forth that we read about in history. But of this restoration, there are men that stand out. Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell of a place not far from you here up in Bethany, West Virginia. There was a man by the name of Martin Stone out of your own state of Kentucky here. And there was a man by the name of James O'Kelly up in the New England states. And on and on, you could just name a number of people that all at one time, this is the, the thing that's so fascinating to me, all at one time, at the same time, they begin to break forth from this reformation. You see, there's a difference between the word reformation and restoration. If you reform something, you take something and you just improve it to make it better. You reform it. But you can't take something that's corrupt and make it better. That's the problem with reformation. You can't reform something that's corrupt to make it what it ought to be. So the reformers, they were looking at it the wrong way. I think, you know, Martin Luther and all them, they did their very best, and I suppose it was going to take a long time to finally get all that done. But what happened was, is that you've got Martin Luther here that's believing a certain thing. You have Zwingli, you have John Wesley, who is the beginning of the Methodist Church, and then you have, you know, John Knox and just a number of other people that started all these other religions. So now, again, you've got something worse than you had to begin with. In the Reformation, they had something worse than what they began with. Because now nobody got along with each other. Nobody was in harmony. They all had their own religions. Even though Martin Luther said, don't call yourself Lutherans, they did that. They, they went ahead and called, him, uh, called themselves Lutherans. So it finally got to the point of the age of Philadelphia. And in this age, doors began to be opened that would never be shut again. And that's what he describes continuing on in this letter. He says, Behold, I know thy works. He said, I have set before thee an open door. So now the door is open once again. I set before you an open door. And he says, No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. He's talking to the church here that's been in hiding for all these years. Behold, and I love this, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. In other words, they're pretending Christians. Pretending Christians. They claim to be Jews, which is a term used for religion in general. He said they claim to be religious, but they're not religious. He said, I will make them, and I will make them to come and sit at your feet and worship at thy feet and know that I have loved thee. During the age of the Restoration, which began approximately in the early 1700s on into the 1800s, was one of the most remarkable movements of the church. The Restoration by these few men that I mentioned right here, by Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell. And they opened up a whole new vision. And they taught restoration. Now to restore something is altogether different than Reformation. Because to restore something, you take an old piece of furniture 
and you restore it to its original condition. You take an old car, you restore it to its original condition. That's restore. And that's what these men were teaching. They said, we will speak where the Bible speaks, and we will be silent where the Bible is silent. That became their, their, their call. That became their plea to the people. And what a movement. What a movement. At one time, and we'll get into this again a little bit later in the week, but at one time, you know, there was only 10% of America that were religious at all because of all this confusion that was going on. People were fed up with religion. Only 10% of, of America was even religious at one point in time. And yet at one point in time, I don't know if you're aware of this, at one point in time, the Church of Christ was the number one church in America during the Restoration because of the preaching of these men right here. They would go everywhere preaching the truth and the, and, and, and the Church of Christ, as far as, uh, as, far as, uh, as people are concerned, the number of people, the Church of Christ was number one in America at one time because... God says, I'm going to open doors for you, and nobody's going to close those doors. And again, I reflect back. I, I was a little bit too young to, to see all of it, but I reflect back to times when people would have gospel meetings, and you'd have old time preachers come in here, you know, the B man and all that stuff, and all those individuals, you know what I'm talking about? And, and they would come in here and they would hold meetings. Man, I, my dad told me there'd be people standing outside the windows just looking in. Because the Bible says, I will make them come and sit at your feet and know that I have loved you. This is the age of restoration. What a beautiful, wonderful time it was. We'll come to that. That's the, that's the bright side of the story. Now we come to the dark side of the story because we have the church at Laodicea. I believe this started in approximately about 1980. I think I've been a part of this age. And I, I'm not going to say it's 1980 exactly, but it has to be somewhere in that area, the late 70s, early 80s. Because up until that time, during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, churches were thriving. And church buildings were full. It's before, you know, all of the progressive things began to come into the church. It was before, you know, people had, everybody had two or three automobiles and had money in the bank and all that stuff, you know, had good jobs. All before that, the church was flourishing. And here's what he says. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say of amen the faithful, the true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Thou art neither hot nor cold. If you were to pick an age of the church, this is it today. People are, people are not on fire for the Lord like they ought to be. And people are not opposed to the Lord as you think they would be. But we're just mediocre. We're just going down the road and we're just, you know, doing whatever we have to in order to get by. You know, we have our services and all that. But we're not doing like a lot of these people did back during the days of the Restoration, back in the, in the times when the church was being persecuted. And he says, he says, I saw that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich. We are, aren't we? I mean, we got to that point where we're rich, actually. I mean, we may not be wealthy people, but we're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and know us not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. People have gotten to the point that they think, well, we don't need God because I look what I have built. Look what I have accomplished. Look what I have. I don't need God. And it's during the times of persecution and depression back in the 20s when people began to turn to God and realize it was, you know, wasn't too long ago. We had 9-11. And I remember those days. Everybody turned back to God. You know, God bless America and so forth and so on. How long did that last? It didn't last very long. It, it, COVID. Look at what during the days of COVID, you know, there everybody was afraid. It's over. They don't care about God anymore. I mean, they were concerned about it for a while, but not anymore. So it's just it's kind of a lukewarm situation that we exist in today. And I believe, as I said, it started as far as my uh, uh, the life was concerned about 1980. I could see the change that was happening in the churches. Here's how I see it happening in the churches. I started preaching in 1972. At that time, we were having 10-day meetings. Some of y'all remember two-week meetings. But at that time, we were having 10-day meetings. I would start a meeting on Friday night, go through Saturday, Sunday, and all the way through the next week. And, and, and our meetings were well attended every night. 
It wasn't long. A few years. We dropped it to week to week, Sunday to Sunday. It wasn't long, but it went. In fact, you, brethren, are the only congregation that I know of that has a week-long meeting. In the whole brotherhood, you're the only one. Everyone else has Wednesday through Sunday. And sometimes, not a, even Wednesday, a lot, most of the time, they don't even want Wednesday and Thursday. We'll just start Friday night. So it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Most of the meetings I have. So you see, there is this lukewarmness that has prevailed in the church today. So it started, as I said, about that period of time, as far as I am concerned. So we're living in the age of Laodicea. The church best describes our time that we're living today. We are rich in need of nothing. People are lukewarm, will not stand for anything. And the, the sad thing about this is, there's not another time coming. So whatever happens, however long the Lord decides to allow this time to continue on, he said, I'm going to come as a thief in the night. And as he comes as a thief in the night, there's going to be so many that are not prepared and not ready to meet that day. Well, as I said, I, I didn't get into a whole lot of things. I hope maybe I've triggered your curiosity as we talk about these various ages and as a part of history, taking it a little more slowly in the next few sermons and, and describing how all of this came to be. We never know the minds of those who are present and hear the sound of our voice and you would like to obey the gospel. We want to extend that invitation to you. One thing I am sure, that the church of Jesus Christ was started in AD 33. And I know for sure that the gates of hell have never prevailed against it. There was one passage there that I forgot to read to you here. I want to turn to it yet. Uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter. And uh, in that passage, he describes uh, the, the, the church. He says... Uh, all beginning about verse 5 and verse 6 of Roman, or Revelations 12. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and three score years. A thousand two hundred three score years. That's twelve hundred and sixty years. That's this period of time that I talked to you about right here. Revelation referred to in another account, 42 months. It's all the same period of time. It's referring to a period of time the church was in this this in the wilderness as it was called and never died. And I'm glad it came back out. I'm glad that I'm able to be a part of it, and you're able to be part of it, we can be tonight. If you would like to obey the gospel, that you not come. Or repent of wrong that you may have committed. Let's stand and let us sing. Take you to 6.30. Hear the sweet voice.